So three weeks ago, we had an evaluation. Yes, for those who are in school, we had an evaluation. And 343 people filled the form. And from the 343 people who filled the form, that data was analyzed. And the major social issues facing our members at the moment are friendship, dating, financial constraints, and academic. And most people wish to join prayer groups. Everything put into consideration, we are able to summarize by four key words, and that is discipleship, task for growth, mental health, and finances. So, and that is what informs our thing. Mostly we put that into consideration as we come up with the thing for the next semester. So that we can also be, can achieve um, what is need in our union at the moment. Yes, so the theme this semester will be, yeah, <laughs> the theme this semester will be growing in faith, and that will be from Second Peter 1, 3 to 10, and I will read. Second Peter 1, 3 to 10, it says, 3 to 11, sorry, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a good life through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do this thing, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, that's the word of God. So I will be talking, I will be doing an expo on growing in faith. Uh, ideally talking mostly about growing in faith. What are we called to grow in faith in scriptures? How is growth? Is it man alone? Is it also an activity that is it a collaborative work of both God, the individual and the church? How do we grow? And the various controversies on growth. And then we'll conclude. Yes. So in verse 3, it says, uh, so as I start off, now let's start off drawing in faith. So in verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. So as we all know, before anything grows, there must be some planting in it. Like before something, anything grows, the, like you must plant for you must plant or something must be born for it to grow. There must be a start, an initial start for it, for it to be able to grow. And from this scripture, I can be able to note that uh, it, it says at, at the end of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So there's a calling, and that's where the start is. And you can get you can understand our state as Christians or as human before we came to Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2 explains that better. I probably they can project Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, it says, <clears throat> As for you, you are dead in your transgression and sin in which you used to live, when you followed of the ways of this world and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, and the spirit who is now at the work in, the, in those who are disobedient. All of, us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the, the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when you are dead in transgression, it's by grace you've been saved. I think I know. Actually, stop there. So from this, we get that as Christians, we were dead in our transgression. We, 
we gratify the cravings of our flesh. And it all began at the Garden of Eden when our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned. And that sin is inherently with us. We carry it. When even a child is born, still considered a sinner because of the inherent sin. And that's why we can't save ourselves. The whole Bible talks about it, and that's why we need, we desperately need Christ to save us from such sin. And that's why actually you are a believer now, because you believed in your heart you are a sinner, you came to the knowledge the Holy Spirit convicted you are a sinner, and now you believed in Him being the only Savior, saving you from your sin, and now you endeavor to live a holy and righteous life by God helping you. Yes. And, uh, and you can attest that after the seed has been planted, of course, there are some growth that has to go, that has to undertake. And the Bible exhorts us to grow, exhort us to grow. And you can ask a friend, uh, do we really need to grow? You can ask a friend, do we really need to grow as Christians? I think you have asked a neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> a neighbor was good to go. Yes, yeah, so let's journey in scriptures to really remind ourselves what we are called to do. And in Ephesians 4, 15 to 16, I'll read. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and build, builds itself up in love and each part does it work. In 2 Thessalonians 1 to 3, we ought to thank God for you, brothers, rightly because your faith is growing more and more, and the love and, every, and the love and everyone has for each other is increasing. So from the above scriptures you can get as Christians, we ought to grow in our faith. It's our journey of sanctification, and we ought to grow. That's what the Bible calls us to. It's not a thing that you think, okay, am I really supposed to grow? Is it necessary? The work of the cross was complete. Oh no. The Bible exhorts us to grow in our faith, not like in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, Like new babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in your salvation. So we can all attest that it's not a silent subject, and as Christians, we really ought to grow in our faith. It's not a matter of, oh, this is what I like, or this is what I feel like, but this is what we are called to, to do as Christians. So the process of growth is what we call sanctification, where those who are declared righteous, the Christ are made holy. I want to a by the name R.C. Oh, R.C. Sproul, said in his book, Everyone is a Theologian, it's, he says, our status before God is based on someone else's righteousness. However, the moment we are justified, a real change is enacted upon us by the Holy Spirit, so that we are increasingly, increasingly brought into conformity with Christ. And that basically describes what sanctification is. That yes, you are saved, you are justified by faith alone, but now you're still on this earth. You're not glorified. Like you're still in this earth to live and to glorify God even in you living on this earth, in this world full of sinners. In this world where mm, not everyone is righteous, of course, it's just among the few who God has called to himself. That even in that, as we, we endeavor to grow in Him, it will all be for the glory of Him. So let it be known, brothers and sisters, that this growth or growing in faith does not signify the following. It does not signify the advance in God's favor. Uh, what I'm saying is, it does not signify God's uh, advance in God's favor or grace because the Christian can either increase or decrease the favor of God nor can anything he does or fail to do alter or affect to the slightest degree his perfect standing in Christ. In your growth in faith, in you growing in faith, it does not in any way advance God's favor or anything. God's favor is the same and will be that, but he calls you still to grow in faith. Not to think that by you growing in faith, there's, there's this feeling of, actually, when I grow in faith, there's more grace that I will get by me growing. Hope you get that. And then the work, and then it also doesn't signify that the work of the cross was incomplete. There's this thinking of when we say we are growing in faith, for those mostly who don't accept the aspect of growing in faith, we think if we are growing in, in faith, then we think 
then the work of the cross was not complete. The work of regeneration at the cross was not complete. But I'm here to, the scripture attests that the work of the cross was complete and still we are called to grow in our faith. So as a normal child is born into this world, naturally the baby is an entire entity in itself, complete in all its parts, possessing a full set of bodily measure, members and mental faculties. As the child grows, there's a strengthening of its body and mind and a development of its members and an expansion of its faculties with a fuller use of, of the one and a clearer manifestation of the other. Yet no new member or additional faculty is added or can be added to it. At regeneration, the soul is made a new creature in Christ so that the old things are passed away and behold, all things become new as we are told in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Yes, and the regenerate soul is a partaker of every grace of the spirit so that we are complete in Christ. For it says in Colossians 2 to 10, it says, For in Christ all fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. That giving us that, when you received Christ, you have the fullness of the deity. It doesn't mean, it doesn't then call us that if we grow in him, in, in, in a way, it's like, strengthening or making the work of the cross more complete but it's calling us when you gave your life to christ it was full like it didn't need anything else it was complete as it was like in for christ all fullness of deity lives in body form and christ has been brought to fullness he's the head of every power and authority and also in first peter we are told first peter 1 3 it says praise be to god the praise to the god and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you and no growth or lack. So, I know, so this is my statement. And no growth on earth or glorification in heaven can make us complete. We are complete at the point of giving our life. The, the salvation we have, it's complete. That is it. But we're still called to grow in faith. So hoping we get that. By us growing in faith, it doesn't mean that we are making the work of the cross complete. Yes. So the question still bends. Then who causes this growth? Who makes us grow? Is it us? Is it us by reading the Bible? Is it us by praying? Is it us by going to church? Is it by our pastors or church leaders? Who makes us grow? Mm -hmm. So Mark 4, 26 to 29 has an answer for us. So there's this parable in Mark 4, 26 to 29. It says, he also said, uh, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night by day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain first, the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the gray, grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So from the above parable, um, hoping they were able to project, yes, so to 29. I can repeat. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, Night by day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain first, the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So from the above parable, hoping you've been able to read the entire thing. From the above parable, the kingdom of God is more specific, and more specific, specifically a Christian, is likened to a man who plants seeds. So the man who plants it is likened to a Christian for the kingdom of God. For he doesn't know how they sprout or even how they fully mature. Or the kingdom of God is likened to a plant that grows while the farmer sleeps or whether he gets up or not, it grows. This is not to say that man should not be always involved in the growth. Uh, that's not what I intend. But it reminds us that it's God who causes the growth in us as men. We don't know how it happens, but he's the one who causes, us, who causes it to happen in us. Same to salvation, we don't save ourselves, but it's the Lord who saves us. 
So, as we all know, this leaves no room for us as Christians to boast for the growth in our faith. As we reflect back, I'm sure if you've been faithful to your journey, to your journey, you can take, you can sit back and just reflect on how you've grown in your faith. There are so many things that you've had to relearn, and there are so many convictions you've developed, and all these. My dear brothers and sisters, let's not take credit for it. Because it's God who causes it in us. It's not us who causes it to happen in our life. It's all God's credit. If we were to boast, then we should actually make it known, to, make it known that it's God who is doing it in us. In Second Peter 2, 2, it says, as I read it earlier, Peter says that you ought to thank God for you brothers and sisters, you brothers, and rightly because your faith is growing. As you can see, it, it says we ought to thank God. It doesn't say that it doesn't say that we ought to thank you, church of the church of whichever church he was talking to. We, we, but it says we ought to thank God because brothers, rightly because your faith is growing. It doesn't say we ought to thank your pastor or your good Bible reading skills, but God, because he takes all credit on your, on your own without the help of the Spirit of God in our hearts, we rebel against the Lord, and that's why for every growth we give glory to him. Yes, in 1 Corinthians 3 to 14, probably they can project, I was not able to highlight it. In 1 Corinthians 3, 4 to 14, mm, First Corinthians 3 to 4, to 4 to 11, it says, For a while on earth, I'm of Paul, and for a while one says, I'm of Paul and another of Apollos, and he, okay, you, you don't have any other, <laughs> <my God. laughs> that will take us forever. Mm -hmm. In First Corinthians 3, 4 to 11, it says, mm -hmm. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. I think that's enough for us to understand. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So Paul is addressing the church of Corinth where there was some church division. Some followed Apollos and others followed Paul. But Paul rebukes them by telling them, Apollos and himself are only but servants through whom they came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each their task. And that's why it says in verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos, wat Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters causes the growth, but only God who makes things grow. So hoping we've been able to learn that this growth or this grow as we pursue this growing in faith this semester, it's not us who, cause who is causing the growth in us, but it's God. For any growth that will for any growth that will encounter the entire semester or has been in the past in the past years, it's all for the glory of God and not us, because it's the one who is causing it in us. Uh, I think I've talked a lot on the subject of God causing the growth in us, but am I in any way saying that Christians and the church have no responsibility in our growth of faith? Of course, no. Uh, growing in faith is a cooperative work of God, the individual and the church, and there's a synergy of the parties involved. It's a cooperative. Like us as believers, we also have a responsibility in our growth. But this responsibility doesn't take the credit for us to think that this growth we have, it's our own doing. After all, for us to be able to grasp the word of God, it takes the Holy Spirit to teach us. It, helps the, it takes the Holy Spirit who dwells in us to convict us of our sins when we sin. And that's why at no instance as Christians are we supposed to boast for our growth in faith. And even as we, as we pursue this growth the entire semester, may we remember it's all for the glory of God and he takes all the credit. So in Second Peter, let's go back to our initial need for our godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. 
Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness, godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. So the scripture starts with the assurance that his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness, godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And that's why in verse 5 it says, for this very reason, for the two reasons we've been given, the 3 and 4, the verse 3 and 4, for this very reason, add your, make every effort, like there's an effort being made by believer there, make every effort to add your faith goodness. So by that, you can all get that you have a responsibility in our growth of faith, in our growing of faith. Another scripture, um, in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, we are told, um, we are told to, I think it's, a, I believe everyone knows the, the verse. Uh, in Philippians, let me read it exactly the way it is. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Uh, Philippians 2, 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, my dear, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works, for it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. So, um, God is working in us to will, yes, but you're also called to participate in this growth with fear and trembling. Definitely, it doesn't mean that when you're reading your Bible, you tremble as you, <laughs> as you read the whole Bible, when you're praying, you're shaking and everything. But, David, <laughs> uh, but just knowing, reading God's word or praying with the knowledge of the conscience of who God is, God being the loving, jealous, merciful, and sovereign God of our all. So the question begs that if I'm a believer, I have a responsibility in my growth, then how am I supposed to go about this? And definitely the book of Second Peter, as we've read, it has an answer for us. And it says, by adding to faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and then love. You and I can attest to that. The above are the fruits, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of God, as highlighted in other epistles, such as Galatians in six, verse 16, and also in verse 22. In Galatians 5, verse 16, it says, "So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the cravings of the flesh." And then in 22 to 26, it highlights the fruits, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, as a forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be consulted and provoking and envying each other. As highlighted in the book of Second Peter 1, it talks of for you to grow in this faith, for this, uh, you have to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance and perseverance goldenness and to goldenness mutual affection and mutual affection and then love. So I know you are wondering, the book of Galatians has told us if we are able, how we come to this fruit is by, by walking in the spirit and not gratifying the cravings of our flesh. Then how do we do this? Yes, thanks be to God we have the means of grace in the church today that help us to develop this fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that is uh, the old and also old Christian disciplines that we tend to we tend to ignore nowadays. And that is the Bible reading, prayer and fasting, fellowship with other believers, and reading Christian literature and many others. So don't misquote me, these are not the only Christian disciplines, but some of the very core cool Christian disciplines that we tend to ignore nowadays. So before I highlight this, these Christian disciplines, 
There are dangers that are to eat as we endeavor to pursue them. The some who lay too much stress upon them that they depend upon them for the means of grace. But they are only means. Hopefully you got what I meant by they are only means for you to grow in faith. They are not what is causing you to grow in faith. As we pursue them, not, don't lay too much emphasis to them that you think this is the only way, I mean, this is the only way that God can do this. But understand that they are only, only means that if which God does not bless them, then they will not avail much. It's the same way for a, for a person who doesn't believe in God. When they go through scriptures, they will just read it like it's a story. But when you're convicted of the Spirit, when you've given your life to Christ, when you read these scriptures, the Holy Spirit is helping you to read and understand the Word. And then there are some who go to the extreme of undervaluing them and thinking that by me being saved by God and having the Spirit of God, then I don't need this help. I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fellowship with other believers because I've been born by God. I've been born of God and thus I don't need to interact with other people to help me grow. I don't need to read the Bible. Others will look for them only which comes from Christ. Of course you and I can attest that by you reading the Bible, by you reading the Bible alone, just reading through it the entire book, is not the only thing that will make you will will give you what only comes to God in Christ. And that's salvation. By you just praying without you having the conviction and allowing them by you not by you just reading the Bible and everything that pertains to Christian discipline is not what makes you to get born again. But it's the conviction that we have in our hearts and professing with our mouth that we are saved. So let's highlight some few, and that is Bible reading. And in Bible reading, um, or reading scriptures, uh, we have so many scriptures that will call us to read the word of God. And the first one being Psalms 1, 6, 1 to 6, it says, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of God. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek with all their heart. They do no wrong when they follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be full, that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I will not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart, and as I learn your, your rations, as I learn your rations laws. And another one is 119, Psalms 119, 105, which says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. So every time, uh, I'll call all of, us, all of us to every time to read the word of God, not necessarily that every morning or every evening, but make a point to read the word of God, to know and to, to, to learn from it. And also, don't just read the word of God, but practice and even teach it. Because James 1, 22 calls us to not be... Do, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his mirror, in, looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, and not forgetting what they have had, by doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So. I want all of us to read the Word of God. I think there are so many Bibles that are available to, all of, to us. Nowadays, we have Bibles in our phones. We also have Bibles being sold out here. I make a point to read the Word of God, for it's for rebuke, for teaching, as First Timothy will say. And the Union has many avenues to nurture this. Just to highlight some is the Bible study, which is ongoing, which started yesterday. You can, you can make a point to join one of the BS groups. There's also a Bible exposition, and it's called Best P for the first years. I think they have never attended any session on Best P. So we also have another session for Bible exposition where you learn how to interpret scriptures. And then another one is the consistent Bible reading, which is called CBR. In there, we'll be taught how you can be able to be consistent in your Bible reading. So when such programs, uh, when such programs kick off, make a point to join one of them. You'll find people who will be able to keep you accountable as you read the word of God. And in that, you'll also be able to grow in faith. Another discipline is prayer and fasting. And prayer is communion with God. It's an owning of his supremacy and acknowledgement of our dependency to the sovereign holy God. Yes, what a privilege, dear friends, to converse with the creator of the universe. As who are dead in transgression have been made right with God. But now, 
as Hebrews will say in 416, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And also in 1 John 5, 14 to 15, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have, we know that we have what we ask of him. And in Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yes, another one which, is, which also calls us to pray is 1 Thessalonians 5 to 17, which you all know, which says, pray continually. Yes, another discipline that you can develop is the fellowship of brethren, as the other semester had taught us. And the previous theme, which was prone to wonder, and the theme verse being Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 24 to 26, which called us to spur one another towards love and good deeds, and not giving meeting up together as some are in the habit of doing so, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Don't ignore these small families in our various ministries, small families in our various it is, small families in our various. Is there any other thing? Apart from the ministries and it is. Yeah. Eh? Prayer groups, yeah. And in our various prayer groups, do not ignore them. They keep us accountable. You can attest by some of the guys who have been in the union for quite some time, like me. Uh, I've been here for like three years. <laughs> yeah, they are very essential. You get people who will be able to keep you in check in this journey of sanctification. You should say that. Going to heaven is not a competition, but it's us as the body of Christ to help one another to be able to reach the goal and that is going to heaven. That in the end you'll be faithful stewards because the faithful servants. Another discipline is Christian literatures, reading the Christian literatures. And by here you need to be very cautious. There are a lot of books out here. It's not like the Bible which is standard. But be very careful the books you read. Of course, being gospel-centered, which does not call you to Christ, then just let it slide. And um, again, here we have a library, a very, very rich library. Uh, make use of them. They usually meet on Friday, on Friday evening, Friday from 4, from 4 p.m. to around 6. And then on Sunday at 2, they're usually open. They have so many good books. You can borrow some, you can borrow some books and then return. Make a point to read such. And even you can have your friend, you can have a friend to read with and to keep you accountable in those books. You can actually buy some, there are some that are sold. Uh, but in all in all, remember the Bible being standard, being the standard, word of God. You might go read all other books, but just remember the Bible is the standard. Don't go to other books that you forget the word of God. Yes. So the journey of growth is gradual, is gradual and full of ups and downs. It's a lifelong process uh, which needs an enormous amount of intensive labor. So there are a lot of heresies on this to topic of growth that we need to shed a light on. That some of us probably we might be in and we don't know because you are not aware. The first being activism, which advocates for self righteousness in which people attempt to obtain growth by their own efforts alone. Where you think you don't need God, by you reading the word of God, by you praying, that alone makes you right with God. But let's remember, what makes us right with God is you in your heart coming to the understanding that you're a sinner and being convicted of that and knowing that it's only God. Not, don't go to the Bible, you don't read the Bible, or don't pray like, probably the entire night and think that that's what is making you right with God. Another thing is quietism, which goes by the slogan that you let go and you let God. Uh, ideally, it sounds like it's right, right? You let go and you let God. Like it sounds like it's right, but in totality, if you think about it well, it says that growing in faith is ex ex exclusively the work of the Holy Spirit, and therefore Christians have no role to play but just to be quiet and let the Holy Spirit do His work. As we have read in the previous books, this this analogy of thinking that uh, because you've been born again, then it's Christ is the Holy Spirit working in you. Then you don't need to do anything for you to grow in faith. 
And as uh, we've read through the, we've read in the other scriptures, we are called to grow in faith, brothers and sisters. We are called to work after our salvation with fear and trembling. So let's remember us. Now let's remember that. Another one is the famous veganism, which is defined in the dictionary as direct or indirect attachment of behaviors, disciplines, and practices to the belief in order to achieve salvation and right standing before God. So in order to grow in faith, we try to legislate God where he has left men free. We create rules and regulations and in the end substitute man-made laws for the real law of God. And this is where you get people thinking that for you to grow in faith then you have to stop, you have to stop having the smartphone, you have to stop, uh, what else is so crazy? You have to stop um, okay, watching movies. As a Christian, you can't watch movies if you want to grow in faith. Yet, we are left free by God, of course, being cautious with what you watch and what you engage in. But not in totality saying that if you watch a movie, then you never grow in faith. You get? Yes. Uh -huh. So the other extreme is a very hard word. Uh, hopefully you are ready for it. It's called antinomanism. Anti no Nyanism, which basically says that the law of God has no bearing on the Christian life. Since we are under grace and hence no need to obey the law of God for us to grow in faith. Hope you get. Where we say, since we are saved by grace, so since we are saved by grace and now the law has no bearing on our life, like we don't need the law at all. We don't need to obey the law of God at all. Where someone will say, I can commit adultery because I'm saved by grace. I'm not under the law. I'm not under the bondage of the law. Where somebody will, will cheat and still say, I'm not under the law. But in Romans 6, 1, 2, it says, What shall we say? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have, been, who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The law of God is good. That's what I have to say. The law of God is, the law of God is good, Christians. And although we no longer are under the bondage of the law, yet we still need to love it and meditate on it because it's pleasing to the Lord. Yes, so I'll conclude with this. Um, one theologian by the name Jonathan Edward, Edwards said in his treatise concerning religious affection that, I hope you get this clearly, true, true growth is not finally mere excitement and the increase in one use of religious language or a growing knowledge of scripture. It's not even an evident increase in joy or in the love or in the concern for the church. Even increase in zeal and the praise of God and the confidence of one's faith are infallible evidence of true growth. But the true Christian growth is a life of increasing holiness rooted in Christ's self-denial. Yes. So all these things are just means of grace, but we, we should be able to see your growth in Christ by the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit being, being, being joy, love, peace, being joy, love, as Galatians will say, I think it was highlighted in Galatians 5, 22 to 26, and even as our team verse will say, for this very reason, make an effort to add your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. And the goal here is not to be, hopefully you also get this, but the goal here is not to be a skilled by Borida. It's not to be the most prayerful person on earth. It's not to be the most faithful member of the union, the best usher in the world, Thing like that, <laughs> or the most van of the most visible church member, or the most visible CU member, but to be the one who understands and know God and has a change at heart. That's the main thing. And when you have the change at heart, it must be able to, manif to manifest. We must be able to see the fruit of the Spirit being shown in you. And how can you be able to do that by not gratifying the cravings of the flesh? And living a, sp a spirit-guided life, a life that upholds God's moral and a life that reflects Christ, being Christ-like. And by ourselves, dear brothers and sisters, we can never do that. We desperately need God to guide us every step of the way. 
and just praying that he may cause that growth in us as we even follow the means of Christ towards growth. Finally, I'll finish with this hymn that says, mm, it's called, O oh Jesus Christ, grow thou in me. I will not sing. Mm. <laughs> I will read it. It says, O oh Jesus Christ, grow thou in me, and all things else, and all things else recede. My heart be daily nearer thee, from sin be daily freed. Each day let thy supporting might, my weakness still embrace, my darkness vanishes, vanishes in thy light. Thy life, my death, a face. I'm missing one. Okay. In thy bright beams, which on me falls, fed every evil thought, that I'm nothing thou at all. I will be daily taught. More of thy glory let me see. Thou holy, wise, and true. I will thy living image be, in joy and sorrow too. Fill me with gladness from above. Hold me by strength. Lord, let the glow of thy great love, thou all my being shine. Make this poor self grow less and less. Be thou my life and aim. Oh, make me daily through thy grace. Make me to bear thy name. That's how I will end it. But just to, if you don't get anything, just know that God is the one who is causing this growth in us. And as Christians, we are called to grow in this way. Not on our own doing, but it's him who works it all in us, and I'll pray as I conclude. Yes. As we reflect our life, as we even go through this semester, I just pray that we pursue growth in God. We'll be able to grow in our faith. So let's pray. Our dear loving, merciful, sovereign Lord, thank you Lord for this time. Thank you Lord for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. And thank you for even gathering us together to just hear your word and to learn of us and exhorting us to grow in this faith, Lord. As we endeavor to go through this whole semester, oh God, Father, will you be able to attest that it's indeed you, Lord, who's been the center of our growth in faith, Lord. As we even go on with our studies, oh Lord, when you take charge, that even in those academics, Lord, you may be able to glorify your name, oh God. As we leave this place, may you guide us, Lord. We pray this believing in Jesus Christ.